Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. What a wonderful song to segue into the book of Daniel. That's where we're going to be uh, this morning and for the next several weeks. So uh, if you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 1. Daniel's in the Old Testament, one of the major prophets there in the Old Testament. And so uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. When you came in today, hopefully you had a chance to uh, get one of the communion cups. If you did not, maybe you came through the door and you slipped by our guys that were handing those out. If you'll just hold your hand up, raise your hand. We've got a, uh, some communion cups we can bring around to you. Okay, everybody, good job, guys. Y'all were very thorough. Um, or people just aren't telling us, and that's possible too. So if you'll notice on this, and I'll direct you through this in just a moment when we get to communion later on in the service, but you'll notice one side has the bread, one side... Uh, has the cup there, and so they have two different seals. You know, it looks pretty self-explanatory, but you never know. So um, just want to share that with you uh, today. All right, if you'll take out your Bibles, turn to the book of Daniel. We're going to start a new series today entitled Exiled, Faithfulness in a Culture of Compromise. It's a study of the book of Daniel, all 12 chapters, and I want to take just a moment to kind of talk about, explain the series, the title for the series. The the book of Daniel is first and foremost a book about God's sovereignty, the fact that God is in control of all things. And so uh, we want to keep that in the back of our mind. Everything we're going to see throughout the book of Daniel over these next 12 weeks really is something that God is doing. Even when we don't see it, he's working. And he really orchestrated and brought all of these things together. But it is also about how to be a faithful witness in a dark and hostile world and culture. See, unlike other books of the Bible, this book is not written from within inside Israel or the surrounding areas. It is written from a place of captivity. Let me show you. In verse 1, Scripture says in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 1, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar. To the house of his God and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Now, before we get too far, let's talk for just a moment about Babylon because there's some deeply important symbolism at work in the book of Daniel as it regards to, to Babylon. Babylon, here in this book, refers to a specific kingdom in the sixth century BC. It's located in what would be modern-day Iraq. But in the Bible, Babylon takes on several different meanings. It also represents a spiritual power that is at work in every secular kingdom in every age. In the New Testament, the early Christians used the term Babylon as a code name for Rome, even though Rome was miles away from the ancient city of Babylon and had no real political connection to the Babylonian Empire whatsoever. Then later in the book of Revelation, Babylon becomes the Apostle John's name for the whole world system that would be in opposition to Jesus and to his plan for humanity. And so you have several layers of what this terminology Babylon means, and so it even kind of permeates the book of of Daniel But for the most part, in the book of Daniel, it is referring to a specific 6th century B.C. kingdom. Did you notice in verse 2, when it said the city of Babylon, where it was, to the land of Shinar? Now, that's Daniel chapter 1, verse 2, but Shinar is a place that is described in Genesis chapter 11, verse 2 where all of mankind gathered together in order to build a tower and to make a name for themselves. Does anybody just off the top of your head remember what the name of that place was? Babel, the Tower of Babel. Babel, Babylon, coincidence? Probably not. The point is, in the Bible, Babylon is the term that is used consistently for 
the spiritual kingdom at work in the secular world powers since the Tower of Babel. It's the kingdom built in opposition to God, independent of God. The kingdom where man is in charge of all things, that we are at the center of all things. Satan has always used secular government, secular media, secular business, secular economics to make war against God's people and against God's gospel. Now, the book of Daniel is written in a very interesting, albeit sometimes confusing way. Chapters 1 through 6, the first half of the book, are events that take place in Daniel's life in Babylon. But there are a lot of famous stories that are in there. You probably remember some of them. Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Things that we remember from our childhood, maybe reading through the book of Daniel. But in chapter 7 through 12, the second half of the book, there are Daniel's prophecies about the future, the restoration of Israel, the coming of the Messiah, and ultimately the end of the world. There's a lot of apocalyptic uh, prophecy that's in here. But there's another way you could actually divide the book of Daniel. In chapter 1, Daniel is written in Hebrew because it is primarily written from the perspective of Israel in the Hebrew language. But then in chapters 2 through 7, which are most of the events of the life of Daniel in Babylon, because it's in Babylon, it's written in Aramaic, which was the language of Babylon. Then chapters 8 through 12, most of the prophetic stories that we're going to get are prophecies about the future and the restoration of Israel. So once again, it's written in Hebrew. So the question of the book of Daniel is this. There's the comfort zone of Hebrew and the challenge of Aramaic. There's living in Jerusalem and Israel, and there's living in Babylon. And so the, the question is this. You know how to be faithful to God in the Hebrew chapters, your comfort zone. But can you also be faithful to him in the Aramaic chapters where you're in captivity, where you're exiled in a hostile land? What does faithfulness to God look like in a secular realm controlled by secular powers that are at war with the gospel? What does it take to remain faithful to God in a culture of compromise? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to trust God's sovereignty instead of circumstances. We have a tendency to look at circumstances and events and moments in time, difficulty, struggles, and we dictate whether or not we can live our life based on how hard our life is. But what we see from the book of Daniel is that's not the way we should be viewing life anyway. This is a temporary place. We are exiled in a foreign land because our home is not here. Our home is with God in heaven, and we know that's where we're headed. So until we get there, can we remain faithful? The first principle is to trust God's sovereignty instead of, instead of circumstances. What does this have to do with God's sovereignty? Well, King Jehoiakim, who was Judah's 19th king after King David, continued to lead Israel in a downward spiral of unbelief compromise, and disobedience. God had warned Israel time and time again that if they continued down this path, he was going to send them into exile. It was not as if this came out of left field. So in 605 B.C., after years and years of consistent rebellion, he kept his promise. If you'd like to see more about how that happened, go to 2 Kings chapter 24. Don't go there now. That's more reading for you in your, in your annual, I'm going to read the Bible, uh, January 1st commitment that you've made. Go to 2 Kings chapter 24 and look that up. You'll see how these events take place. But here's what I want you to notice. Look back at verse 2. The Bible says, The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his, that's Nebuchadnezzar's, hand. In other words, everything that happens to Israel, everything that happens to Daniel, everything that happens to his three Hebrew companions is filtered through the strong and sovereign hand of God. He ultimately brought this about because of Israel's 
unfaithfulness to him. God is always faithful, but Israel wasn't. And they had to live in a world of compromise in opposition to God because they had been living a life opposed to God. Now, let me point this out before we go any further, because you may be thinking, and it's really tempting for us to look at the book of Daniel and think to ourselves, those Israelites, man, they were always getting themselves into trouble. All they had to do was listen to God and to obey God, do what they were supposed to, and everything would have been fine, but over and over and over again, they just constantly dropped the ball. It would be really easy for us to point our fingers and shake it at them and talk about how unfaithful they were. But here's what I believe. We're just a few minutes into this sermon, and I believe that God is already right now speaking to some of us through his word by saying, if you think you can continue to live in sin, in open, habitual rebellion against me, and claim to be one of my children, children, you've got another thing coming. We tend to think about God as though He doesn't care what we do. Oh, he's a forgiving God. It doesn't matter what I do. I can do whatever I want to, and he'll forgive me. Clearly, throughout Scripture, that is not the way God interacts with his children. That is not what he allows us to do. He is a good and holy and just father who disciplines his children. And there's no reason for us to think that it is beyond God to send us into our own exile, into our own circumstances of suffering, Over and over throughout Scripture, throughout church history, God has brought down puffed-up believers who thought they could live however they wanted to live in spite of what God was calling us to do for His glory and for His kingdom. Paul says, God will not be mocked. Do not be deceived. We don't need to mistake God's patience with apathy. He does care. He cares about our lives. And His desire is that we would use our lives as a faithful testimony to him so for many of us the book of Daniel is a wake up call get serious about your life god's paying attention and he will not be mocked but even in the midst of our sin even in the midst of our rebellion even when we don't see it he's still working it is true that god works even when we sin no matter what we do god's will is going to be accomplished So even though Jehoiakim and all of Israel were in a constant state of disobedience and apathy towards his truth, God's still revealing his sovereignty to us through this book. He caused this exile to happen because of their sin, but he's going to bring deliverance in spite of that sin. For that faithful remnant that we're going to be introduced to four of those people today, but there were others that were faithful to him. Unfortunately, When we sin, there are consequences for our sin. And even though God is at work in spite of our rebellion, sometimes our sin causes us to suffer. But the good news is this. God still works even as we suffer. Even as we experience things maybe that we brought about because of our own sin or that was brought about on us because of the sin of others or that because we live in a fallen, sinful world. Notice what happens in verse 3. Then the king commanded... Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility. He didn't just simply besiege the city. He took all of the best parts of the city of Jerusalem back to his kingdom. Verse 4 says, Youths without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature of and language of the Chaldeans. Now, a lot of things going on here, but here's the reality. He had them collect the best of the best, the resources of Israel, which included the best of the best people. And then what did he want to do with the best of the best of the people? He wanted to indoctrinate them with the things and the ways of Babylon. They were to become schooled in the way life is done in Babylon. Now, here's the thing. Most of you like Daniel, have been called to serve in Babylon. Not that country in the 6th century B.C., it's a little late for that. But in our Babylon, in a secular world, outside of the walls of this church, certainly there are people that are called to minister inside the walls of the church, 
But for all of us, at least at some point, we have to go outside. We have to live a life six out of seven days of the week working and living in Babylon, in exile. And Daniel is a book that is a manual for how to survive and thrive and most importantly, how to shine your light out in a dark, secular world. Now, obviously, we'd all prefer to be in our comfort zone. We'd prefer to be in our holy huddle. We'd prefer to stay safe around people just like us. Sometimes when we go outside of these walls, we still only congregate with people like us because they're safe and they would never harm us. And if we get outside of our holy huddle, then we might face ridicule. We might face persecution. We might actually face suffering because certainly we know that within the church family, nobody ever fights. There are never any problems here. We're always getting along, right? But the reality is this, if it's hard inside of our church family, we know it's hard outside there, so how can we possibly be what God wants us to be? But here's the reality. You must trust in His sovereignty, in His providence, in His faithfulness, above and beyond all the circumstances that you may encounter because of your sin or because of the sin of others, because we are here for such a time as this. God's desire is that you would live for him and be faithful to him in a world that is not faithful to him. But secondly, we must trust God's instruction rather than the culture. God has given us his word and his word instructs us on how to live from some of the most practical things to some of the most spiritual and theological things and everything in between. Notice verse 5. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate. This is the best of the best that were taken into captivity from Israel. He assigned them a daily portion of the food that that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Daniel here, one of four young men, good-looking, smart, healthy, athletic, they were drafted into Nebuchadnezzar's service. But I don't want you to think about this as though it were an episode of Jerusalem's Got Talent. Okay, this is not a fun talent show that's taking place here verse 3 says they were put under the chief eunuch which means from all practical purposes they would have been been made eunuchs also which means their capacity to have kids was quite literally crushed plato said that people enrolled in these training programs they were usually around 14 to 17 years old so more than likely we can assume that daniel and his companions were probably 15 or 16 years old Nebuchadnezzar had their names changed. Why? Because they had good Hebrew names which pointed to the glory of God. And Nebuchadnezzar had their names changed because he wanted them to praise him and his gods. Now that's not unusual because in a secular world run by a culture of compromise, we are constantly seeking our own glory. The culture seeks its own glory. That's just the way it is. That doesn't mean that Babylon was different than any other secular culture of the world it constantly wants to build a name for itself that's what we've always been doing as a society as a culture and in seeking its own glory it sort of plays out in this particular story by the changing of their names it sort of shows its ugly head in that way Daniel his name means God is my judge but his name was changed to Belshazzar which We don't know for certain, but probably means Baal protects the king. Hananiah, God is gracious. His name was changed to Shadrach, which means under the command of Aku, which was the moon god. Mishael, there is none like God. Changed to Meshach, there is none like Aku. Azariah, God has helped me. To Abednego, the servant of Nebo, the Babylonian god, of wisdom. Now, let's take just a moment, pause, back up, and think about what's just happened in the world of these 15-year-old teenage boys. Keep in mind, these are real people. 
It's not just some story. This, just, this is not just something that's told to help inspire you. Real teenage boys, high school age boys who watched as their homeland was invaded and destroyed. More than likely, their families were killed. Their temple, where they worshipped, was totally desecrated. Their future as husbands and fathers destroyed. And their names were changed to give praise to foreign deities. And some of us feel like it's hard to live this Christian life in the world that God has placed us in. God, I dare say Daniel's probably got you beat. We complain about a lot of things, but we probably haven't even heard of stories like this. And if we have, they're few and far between. When in reality, many of our brothers and sisters in Christ all around the globe experience this on a daily basis. In light of the exile that we find ourselves in, which by comparison is probably not that difficult, how can we remain faithful when everything in our world tells us to blend in, to fit in, and to be like everybody else? Well, the culture seeks its own glory, but as a child of God, you should seek God's glory. I want you to notice how da Daniel responds. Verse 8. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. We'll get to why in just a minute. But the royal food and wine would have included a lot of things that were forbidden for, from the Torah for Israel to eat, to partake in. The, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, the book of the law, had several different dietary restrictions in it. So here is really Daniel and his companions' first test of faith. Will they conform to the scriptures that they've been taught since birth? Or will they cave to the culture of Babylon? And you may say, it's just food. What difference does it make? But it was the start of a much greater rebellion against the things of God. So Daniel asks if he and his friends can eat from a different menu. Now this is a pretty annoying request from a prisoner because nobody in charge of feeding a group of people likes it when different people demand different things than the menu that they have provided any moms out there want to say amen today anybody paying attention nothing irritates beth and i more than one of our children asking for a different meal than the one that we have prepared for the family for that evening listen we got one kid who's going to remain nameless that hates every food on the planet if it's what you fixed for dinner they may have even asked for it hey what do y'all want for dinner and this is what they say and then we fix it i don't want this you asked for it yeah but I, that's what i wanted then i don't want it now it is so infuriating if it's not on the menu it is the favorite food in the world but put it on a plate and set it in front of them and it might as well be poisonous. And as irritated as that makes us, I cannot imagine what it would be like if I was in charge of feeding prisoners and they started to complain about the food that was served to them. In other words, this is not a great way to find favor with your captors. But notice verse 9. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. Remember, the book of Daniel is primarily about God's sovereignty. He is faithful. And when we are faithful, what we will see consistently throughout Daniel and throughout Scripture is that God notices it and responds. Verse 10, And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink, for why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who were of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. So this wasn't just simply, I don't like your request. This was, if I listen to your request, it will put me in danger. Verse 11, then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to to what you see. This is a 15-year-old boy. I mean, I got some of them in my house. They can't even wrap their own burritos. 
and all of the sudden, God has given them wisdom to be able to have this conversation. Here's a reality in Scripture, just so everybody is aware of it. Whatever God calls you to do, He will equip you to do. And 15-year-old boys shouldn't have been ready to have this conversation with these types of people. But God was working even when they didn't see it. Now here, I don't, please don't be short-sighted. And please don't think that Daniel just gave you some secret, super Jesus-blessed keto diet. That's not what happened here. Some of you are like, I knew it. Just vegetables and water and everybody will be strong for the rest of our lives. Seriously, it's not a secret. If you eat fewer calories and burn more calories, you'll lose weight. And your response to that may be, hey, Alan, we're probably not going to take weight loss lessons from you. Okay, touche, I get it. Here's my point. That's not the point of this passage of Scripture. He wasn't giving us a diet. He was talking about faithfulness. There were evidently only things, there were certain things that they could not eat because they were ritually defiled. For one reason or another, we don't know all the details. Now, you're free to follow Daniel's diet if you want, but that's not the point of this chapter in Daniel. The point of this chapter is that we must live a life faithful to God, not to the culture, even in the small things, because the small things turn into the big things when we begin to compromise what God has told us to do. It means that we must also trust God's faithfulness to honor our devotion. We spend a lot of our life trying to find honor and recognition from a world that hates us and hates our God. When God has called us to share his love and compassion with that world because they desperately need it, even though they don't know it. It is not a life of holier than thou. It is not a life of I told you so. It is a life of mercy and compassion that is lived for a people who are going to be lost without God if we don't share this message of hope with them. And if we compromise what he's told us to do, here's the reality. You can't make a difference unless you are different. And if we really want to see God working in our society, in our communities, in our families, in our world, then we must be willing to live for him. Notice what happens next. Verse 14. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh, that's what we're hoping for, than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables, every kid's worst nightmare, except Daniel and his companions. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Here's a principle we need to be reminded of. God will bless you personally. When you are faithful to him, God bless them. This is a principle that we see over and over again throughout Scripture. When you commit to doing things God's way, God notices and often glorifies himself by building you up and honoring you. Now, I want you to be careful. This is not a magic formula. Sometimes, as we will see in the book of Daniel, if you do the right thing, you're going to suffer for it. I mean, we see that throughout Scripture, right? We love the stories of Joseph and David and Daniel. But Joseph went through a lot of heartache before he was elevated to the second highest position in the land of Egypt, right? He was sold into slavery by his own brothers. He was put into the palace at the king, but he was falsely accused and imprisoned and went through some terrible things and questioning why was he in these positions until God raised him up. But you know why he raised him up? Because of his faithfulness. David went through a lot of heartache. He was fighting lions and bears and Philistines. He was running from kings, and even his best friends, and even his sons were trying to kill him. But God still honored and brought glory to himself by lifting up and honoring David. Right here with Daniel, we see both sides of this roller coaster, the up and down of the circumstances of life, which is why we must trust in God's sovereignty. But the basic principle is this, and I'm telling you, we see it throughout Scripture, a consistent Biblical testimony is that those who honor God, he honors. He may not honor it with all types of worldly possessions, but he honors those that are faithful to him. And he did so with Daniel, 
He did so with his companions. But here's another reality. God will bless others through you. Throughout the book of Daniel, what we're going to see is that Daniel and his companions became an invaluable tool and resource for all the different kings that ultimately ruled over them. Verse 18. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Daniel his three Hebrew companions remained faithful to their true identity. They obeyed God. They were a shining testimony and a witness, both to God's providence and his sovereignty and to his grace. God's sovereignty was on display fully in the land of Babylon through the faithful living of his servants in a culture of compromise. He sent them on a missionary journey leaving all that was familiar so that they might bear a faithful and true witness to the kings and nations in foreign lands. And the, and the crazy thing is that throughout the book of Daniel, God is going to bring the kings of other nations to Daniel. He's not going to have to go into captivity to all these places. He's going to bring them right to his doorstep. But ultimately... These four Hebrew teenage boys point us to another Hebrew who would arrive 600 years after the events of this would take place, who was also sent to a foreign land to bear witness to the one true God, a Jew by the name of Jesus. Like Daniel and like his friends, the Son of God would leave his home and willingly embrace a sinful world without defiling himself, not even once. Like these Hebrew boys, he would find favor with God and with man. When he was still a child, his teachers were amazed at his understanding, were amazed at his answers to questions that were beyond his years. Jesus is the embodiment of all of God's wisdom. But you know, there's a certain irony to the contrast and comparison of these stories. It's hard to miss. It's a grace-filled, gospel-rich principle. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah are going to give a faithful witness before the chief eunuch, ultimately before Nebuchadnezzar the king, they're going to be brought in to live in the king's palace. But Jesus, by contrast, was going to give a faithful witness as well. Before Herod, before Pilate. And instead of bringing him into the palace, they're going to nail him to a cross. But it is by his death that all of us who trust in him will forever be able to live with the King of kings and the Lord of lords in his palace. Isn't that interesting? God delivered Daniel into the palace, but God sent his only son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life so that we might enter into his palace. This is not our home. It's why we shouldn't keep our eyes on circumstances. It's why we should keep our eyes fixed on our heavenly father and his sovereignty in spite of our circumstances because God's desire for us is to trust in his son because he demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, while we deserved exile, Jesus Christ died for us. Here's how I want us to end our time together this morning. I want us to end it by focusing on what we can do as the servants of the Most High God because of the sacrifice of Jesus to live a faithful life in a culture of compromise. It's all made possible because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So for you, right now, in this moment, here's what I want you to do. Just bow your heads. 
I want to read a passage of Scripture, but I want to give you some time of self-reflection today to think about your relationship with your Heavenly Father. What kind of life are you living? Is it a testimony of faithfulness? Is it a light shining in a dark place? Or is it a life of compromise? Listen, we've probably all experienced both. But just for a moment, just you and God, maybe today needs to be a day of surrender. Maybe today needs to be a day of repentance. But certainly before we come together before the Lord's table, we need to take a moment and evaluate our lives. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven through 29 says this, and then I'll let you and God do business today. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Just you and God for a few moments. Father, in this room are people in many different walks of life, maybe many different stages of their spiritual journey. Maybe some that have never put their faith and trust in Jesus, and some who have, some who are faithful, some who are struggling. The reality is we've all been in every one of those places. It's not so much who we are, but what we're doing right now. So God, I pray this moment and the testimony of your word speaking to our heart today would remind us that we need to trust in you. We need to trust in your sovereignty, in your word. And we need to seek after your will. And the only reward or honor that we desire is yours. God, we know you are faithful. Help us to be found faithful as well. Lord, as we come to your table today and remember the body of our Lord that was broken on our behalf, may we never forget. He didn't do anything wrong. He lived a perfect life. He committed no crime. So we are reminded that it is by his stripes that we are healed. It is for our crimes that his body was broken. And may we never forget. It should have been us. Thank you for the body of our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll take the cup and open up the side with the bread in it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 24. Scripture says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you join me in a prayer for the cup as well? Father, again, we come to you and we thank you for the blood of Jesus, our Savior. Your word has told us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And for ages past, sacrifice had to be made for individuals, for families. But the ultimate sacrifice was when your one and only son came to give his life as a ransom for many. To shed his blood for the remission of our sins. 
And again, God, he'd never done anything wrong. He'd committed no crimes. He was not at fault. And yet, his body was pierced. And his blood flowed. May we never forget it should have been us. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. Scripture says, In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. That very next verse, verse 26, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. God sent these four Hebrew teenage boys on a missionary journey to point to the sacrifice that was to come through Jesus Christ some 600 years later. But now, God is sending us on a missionary journey 2,000 years after the death of Christ, to proclaim his death until he comes again. We must remember that in the midst of our struggles and our suffering and living a life in a world that doesn't want to hear the things that we believe, that God is still in control of everything just as he was in Daniel's day. And whatever happens to you is filtered through his strong, sovereign hand, which means you can be strong. You can be of good courage. You can continue to be faithful because whatever God has called you to do, he will equip you to do. He is accomplishing something in you that is greater than you could possibly understand on your own. You want to know why? Because God is faithful. That's how we want to close our service today. Just singing a few verses of that song about the faithfulness of God. He's called us to be faithful in a culture of compromise, but not on our own. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Our trust can be in him.